I think our conversations are always enlightening for in both directions. Uh, and so the feedback I've gotten from people in the past has often been that they're actually happy just to sit in on our conversations. Right. <laughs> and so, sure, let's just have a conversation. But if you have specific questions on any of those topics that you just mentioned, yes, they're, they're all very exciting. And, and I think people would find them very interesting. What's going on, uh, what they can't anticipate and how I'm, how I'm perceiving is the next way for me to be the most useful to people in growing up the raw vegan movement. Yeah. That's a great phrase that you use growing up the raw, raw vegan movement. And why do you say that? Like what, Obviously, you've been in it for a long time. So what, what did it used to be like or how is it changing now? Well, in 1999, I was, at a, I was at a festival called the San Francisco Raw Festival. I mean, hmm. I, think it, I think that was their third San Francisco Raw Festival. But, um, and at that festival, one of the speakers in giving his introduction said... I want to promote raw food until it's the number one topic of conversation in America. <laughs> and, and when I got up to give my introduction, I said, well, I want to continue to educate about raw food and, and promote raw foods until it's so commonplace that nobody even talks about it anymore. There is no discussion to be had. It, it's just automatic. Uh, I want it to be accepted. I don't want it to be like being under review. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any room for a question really at this point. Uh, and that was back in 1999. I, I said, there's no, there's really no room for question. The raw food diet is the way to go. It brings the best results. It's, it's the most chemically, biologically, and ana anatomically, physiologically sound. And, and why, Anybody would question it. I mean, I understand there's reasons and that's what social leadership is about. And, and, and we're looking at other titles, you know, of eating, eating, eating for sanity in a world gone crazy with food, or I don't know what exactly it's going to end up being, but, uh, it's it, the process of, of the word is zeitgeist. Mm. Uh, we don't, we don't really have an English translation that works much better than mindset, but it's not really mindset because it's the, it's the, the view of the people. And the view of the people is, is constantly evolving. It's constantly growing and changing. Uh, I want to get to a point where raw food is much more accepted. I want to get to a point where raw food becomes the norm. Uh, I want to get to the point where when people say raw food, they mean 80-10-10, and when they say 80-10-10, they mean raw food. Uh, and, and I'm seeing this change. I mean, mm -hmm. I, just spent, I just spent several weeks in Chicago, and the number of places that I could eat on the streets of Chicago was amazing to me. <laughs> whereas, whereas I've been to lecture in Chicago in each of the past three or four decades, and, and eating out was almost an impossibility mm -hmm. or there might have been a place, you know. And, and now I could go almost every street corner offered something that was pretty upscale, good quality, fresh, organic food. And I went to, Man to Manhattan, spent a week in Manhattan, and I was just blown away practically Glass on practically every storefront was saying organic, raw, whole, fresh, ripe fruit. I mean, it was just all the key words that I've used to describe the quality of food for the last 25 years 
were now appearing on storefronts and inside the stores and on labels and on all kinds of packaging. And there was, there was a, a chain of stores that only sold fresh made juices every morning. And there was a, a chain of stores that only sold fresh salads. And I mean, they were, you couldn't go two blocks without coming up. Besides all the produce stores, you could just, everything was being, 15 years ago, I knew the guy who used to import more than half of all the organic food that came into New York City. And it was worth a couple million dollars a day in produce. Now, the amount of organic, I mean, organic was everywhere. Organic was, I walked into like pretty low end grocery stores and they had an organic section. And I walked into stores that, stores that just happened to sell produce and they sold organic produce. It was, it was just astonishing to see how much change has happened already. And I think like smoking, uh, organic is going to become the norm again. Uh, raw is going to grow to become the norm again, as it was. It's not that long ago that raw food was the norm in human history. I mean, you know, we, we ate raw food for 99% of the time we walked on earth. And, and it's going to become the norm again for a lot of different reasons. And, and I have fun talking about all those reasons. It's not really the conversation of the day, but there are a tremendous number of reasons mm. that are pushing us towards eating raw and eating organic. So I mean, it's just a matter of whether you want to be at the front end of that wave or <laughs> at the rear end of that wave, because that's the direction, that's the zeitgeist, the mindset. If you walk into a, if you walk into a, a public building Say you walked into some government building now and you saw somebody smoking a cigarette, it would seem, it would just seem wrong. Or if you got on an airplane and there was somebody smoking a cigarette, it, it would just seem wrong. It's not just that it's illegal. It's now the mindset of the people has been to the point where somebody smoking in such a, in such a setting, eventually it's going to be somebody smoking in any setting is going to seem wrong. <laughs> we can see that coming, right? Mm. Um, even though the vapes are everywhere these days, but, right. but they'll, they'll, it's a temporary thing. Let me hear, I just want to hear how, how so okay. a lot to answer the question, but I'm excited about the changes that I see. And for me, it's always been about growing up the movement because, because I've talked to many, many people in the raw movement who said, they want a bigger slice of the pie. They're trying to grow their business so they can get a bigger slice of the pie. I've never, ever felt that way. I've always wanted the pie to get bigger. Let's just start with a much bigger pie. If we've got 100,000 raw fooders, or I don't know how many we have, but if we have so much, so such and such number of raw fooders in the world, and there's, that means there's 6 billion people who aren't. We've got, we've got a huge market to tap. Yeah, I think, uh, I, I don't want to interject too many of my opinions, but I Dude. think one of the problems is, like you're talking about leadership there, that there is people in the raw food movement, raw vegan movement, and they're trying, they're creating information that is tar targeting raw vegans and people that are already. So someone like maybe you or uh, Christina or someone else is trying to bring people into the movement and then other people are just trying to promote to those people who oh, <laughs> that small group of people whereas i i kind of feel like almost everyone that's come into the movement has a specific reason why for example it could be that they had bad skin it could be weight loss it could be arthritis it could be anything and the, the, why don't they make information for those people that are a much bigger group the people that have problems with their skin with arthritis that's a huge massive massive group of people that they could try and appeal to say that they've got a, pro a solution to that problem and then gradually introduce them to uh, nutrition and raw foods um, so that's I think that's similar to what you're saying in a sense is that that's how we grow the, the pie for everyone we stop saying let's just try and promote like how to 
how, how to tweak the raw food diet to get it slightly better, but instead of doing that, just getting appealing to more people like that is a, is a thought I've had. Well, that's, cert but, that's uh, certainly part of it. It's certainly part of it. I mean, in my own career, um, I've been asked hundreds of times mm -hmm. to create materials for specific diseases. Yes. And I understand the mindset of that. Uh, and how it te basically would be the same book, you know, how to overcome heart disease, how to overcome asthma, how to overcome, you know, intestinal disorders, how to overcome diabetes, how to, o and we could do the how to overcome series. And there wouldn't be much that you would have to change from book to book to book, which to me seemed like, To me, it seemed like a cop out. It sure. was. It, it's not what laws of life is going to be. Laws right. of life says that if we can, if if I can teach people how to apply biology, how in the in the world of science, they they use what are called applied sciences. They they have a applied chemistry. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but nobody's ever created an applied physiology, which is what 801010 is all about, applied physiology. Right. Um, whereas the laws of life is, in my view of the world, it's applied biology. Yeah. So what I want to do is show people how to take the laws that that literally control our biology or the laws under which our biology operates and explain that in a way that people can say oh i understand that why you know, either why did nobody ever tell me before or why why isn't this common knowledge and 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 it is it's just not being the information isn't being doled out in a way that's user friendly, which has always been what I've done is to take the science, make it user friendly, and then give people a way to apply it. And so it, it was back in the eighties, I used to do lectures on, a, on the laws of life where we would explain the various laws of life to people, uh, what they were, how they worked, how they didn't work. Um, what I'm doing with the book, though, is then saying, okay, here's an example. If you live in this particular way, if you do this in this situation, this, you, would either be, you would either be confirming the law, living within the law, or you would be attempting to break the law, in which case the law is going to become apparent, it will break you, and you will fail in your efforts because you tried to break this particular law. Yeah, so you've, you've, all, you've had a t-shirt that says you can't break the laws of nature, you can only uh, prove them. Absolutely. Where, where do these laws come from? Who, who studied Not them? me. What? I didn't write any laws. I, I mean, I, I did not write laws. Um, I first came across laws back in the 80s when I was reading health history books um, from, I, I started learning about our, our history in terms of raw foods and, and studying the, the teachers from the 1800s, as many of them as I could. Uh, some of that was fact and some of that was fiction uh, in terms of the material that they promoted. Sometimes people missed the point and then into the early 1900s and, and just looking at, at what you would call our roots, the roots of the, the roots of what we now call modern day health science. Sure. And modern day health science um, is constantly catching up to what was taught back in the 1800s when people had stark realizations um, Anyway, some of them wrote about a few laws. And then, and I don't know, I honestly don't know how 
they came to the insight of those laws. I've never found. But one guy wrote one, one guy credited three or four laws. Certainly Dr. Shelton wrote, wrote or at least brought to light, I don't know where he found them, uh, a few more laws. Uh, Dr. Herbert Shelton kind of created cohesiveness and coherence out of, out of a wide variety of things that were happening in the health industry in the early 1900s all the way up until I mean, up until his death in 85. But um, because there was a hydrotherapies and there was air therapies and there was um, physical culture and various other movements, and each of them had things to offer, but then they had other stuff. And he kind of like separated the chaff from the grain. He's, he's credited with having been the guy who said, okay, and, and he published a bunch of the laws. Uh, eventually, um, eventually the, the last few laws that I found, I actually found in 1985. And, and that was enough so that I then had 36 laws and could break those down into a book, explain what each one means. The laws themselves are very, very difficult to understand. You have to, it's not light reading. Um, they're often sentences that are 60 to 90 words long, and you really have to pay attention. <laughs> but by the time you read it and then go, okay, what does that mean? Well, okay, here's what it means, and here's how you would apply it, and this would be contrary to the law, and this would be, an this would be a lifestyle situation where it would apply. Uh, it, it's fascinating stuff. And I'm finding it most fascinating uh, when I talk with athletes and coaches because there's, we're doing two completely different things, which is so medical model. And, and as you know, I, don't, I view the world as ha there's two models in terms of our health and there's a medical model and there's a health model and the medical model says do a completely different thing in one situation than you would in another. If, you, if you're healthy, do one thing, but if you're not healthy, do something different in order to get healthy. Yep. And then once you're healthy, then you go back to doing the things that made you sick. Um, whereas the health model says do what makes you healthy, and when you're not healthy, do what makes you healthy, and when you are healthy, do what makes you healthy. So... But in, in the world of sport, we, we use the word recovery. Uh, you know, it's, it's a popular phrase these days. And, and in the world of sickness, we use the word recovery. Recovery from surgery, recovery from disease, recovery, you know, from accidents and illness and injury and ill health. Uh, but the way we go about the two types of recovery are completely different. And so for athletes, we try to irritate and stimulate them into health. We try to shock them into, into recovery. Whereas with healthy people, with, I'm sorry, with sick people, people in intensive care units, they're not getting shocked into health. They're getting nurtured into health. Right. The same as we would for young people. So to me, it makes more sense for the athlete to nurture himself into health than it does to shock himself into health or herself into health. I, I don't see the, I mean, what I'm seeing done in, in pro sports is after, after a workout, they wrap in ice, they go jump in ice baths, they go into hyperbaric chambers, they go into blood flow restriction machines. They're, they're all kinds of shock treatment. It's all, it's, it's things you would never do to build your health. Uh, were you a healthy person or were you a sick person? And what it does, in my opinion, is shortens the athlete's career. Well, that's an interesting question, Doug, is because this has become a little bit of a fashionable thing, is obviously the ice baths when it comes to athletics, but it's becoming a bit of a thing um, for people to do almost as a health practice or something. Maybe it's a mindfulness thing or 
so, uh, controlling yourself or whatever it is of people going into ice cold water, cold water. What's uh, obviously you've got a background in sports and, uh, and things like that. What's your opinion on that? Well, I believe that children develop in the in the absolute ultimate way when they are nurtured and supported right. <laughs> and that adults who face a much tougher day they have a much tougher life there's a lot more stress in adult living than there is in a child's life um, that adults need adult sized portions of nurturing and right. and yes and yes you, that that includes fitness training fitness training is not something that's supposed to be horrible it's not supposed to almost kill you you know if you if you if it doesn't kill you you get stronger um, <laughs> Fitness training, um, essentially, you know, if we look at the least fit people in the world, it's infants. They can't hold their head up. They can barely turn over in bed. Some of them can't even turn over in bed when they're really young. Those are the least fit human beings, is infants. But the most fit human beings as a group would be, what, 12-year-olds? 13 year old somewhere around there that we're probably about peaking sure. um, in terms of if you took all the 12 year olds in the world and compared them to all the 20s the 20s might be bigger and stronger but they'd also be fatter and sicker and and a yeah. lot of unhealthy and careers over already um, I would say maybe somewhere around 12 we're hitting our peak in terms of fitness the, the development that happens in those 10 years of life between zero and 10 is just astonishing. And that does not happen by shocking or jolting or forcing or irritating or stimulating. Um, it happens strictly by play. They just go out and play with intensity. And, and so should we, we should play with intensity as, as adults. And that will create development that, that is still nurturing to us. Excellent. So you're not a big fan of the ice baths, is what you're saying? <laughs> so <laughs> can I withstand it? I, I've done ice plunges. I've done, I've done, most ice plunges are around 50 degrees. They're not, I mean, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. I don't know what the, what's that, 10 degrees centigrade. Um, nine, technically nine degrees centigrade. Right? So I, I've done ice plunges um, that were one degree centigrade. You know, 33 degrees Fahrenheit, and and those are seriously cold. I, I've done them, and it's shocking. I, what was I thinking at the time? I needed to jump into ice water at the time because it was part of what I needed to do in order to get to where I wanted to go. So I've done them, but would I do it as a health practice? No way. Right. But it's a shock, it's a stimulant, it wakes you up like crazy. It's a jolt. Yes. So is a so is a cattle prod. <laughs> or a te or a, what do they call it? A taser. You know, yeah. maybe if we took a taser and just tamed it down a little bit, uh, we could just bam give you a jolt. A cattle prod would be basically it. And and man, you'd be awake like nobody's business after. So is a bee sting. But. Absolutely. And, but in the, in the medical world, like for multiple sclerosis, they're using bee stings as a way of trying to help people heal from multiple sclerosis. Sure, sure. It's not working. They, they tell you up front, it will not work, but it might slow down the progression of the disease. Which is, wow, I'm going to, it won't work. They tell you up front, it won't work. But, you know, it might slow down the, well, gee, so might a cattle prod. Sure. So or a nice plunge. But it definitely, you know, with athletes, they have, they have a relatively limited lifespan. Yes. Quite, I mean, they're, they're, an athlete's lifespan is like dog years. So if you get 10 years out of an athlete, you've done pretty well in pro sports. Um, 
And I think a lot of that is because they are depending on shock therapy on an almost daily level or an almost daily basis in order to recover. And it's, it's not a practice that we need to, we don't want to, and it's, it's filtering down, you know, to the mainstream people. And I don't think it's a, it, that's not the way to go. It's not what I'm teaching my pro athletes to do. Yeah. Well, we've got a lot of questions here. We might as well go into the questions. A sure. lot of questions. Great. And I, I won't be too long winded. I'll, let's cover a lot of ground. Yeah. If we could maybe restrict it to some, you know, as two or three sentences for some of them and maybe longer for others, but, uh, some of them are more. So someone said, how is your approach to diet and maintaining health altered as you moved through your fifties and sixties? I don't think, I don't think the years have changed my approach to diet in any way. Uh, my lifestyles changed a bit in my fifties and sixties as probably had most of the people watching. We spend a lot more time pushing buttons than we used to. Uh, and, and my lifestyle in some ways is far more sedentary than it was when I had to, had to push a wheelbarrow or pull a wheelbarrow or whatever. Uh, you know, if I wanted to talk to my neighbors, I had to go over and visit, get on my bicycle and go. Uh, nowadays it's, it's push button world. So yeah. I spend a lot, I spend more time sitting and and my oh and i've my passions in terms of sport have changed somewhat uh, as i've gone through various various types of sport activities to see what was interesting for me uh, so currently my calorie demand isn't quite as high as it was between sitting a bit more and and, and perhaps a bit less cardio than I used to do. Well, for sure, less cardio than I used to do. Um, so my total calorie intake is down a bit. I would say other than that, no, no, real, no real change. Fruits and vegetables. I love fruits. I love vegetables. And they love me well, back. Connected to that, there's, there's a few questions, I guess, related to conditions that are more you know, that are more relevant for people that are getting older. So Everybody's getting older. Yeah. So, <laughs> so someone said um, they're worried about dementia and, they th and I think they're worried about the idea that, that somehow that's maybe connected to raw food. Um, I, I'm not sure, so, something like that. And let me just check what the question is. Um, I'm worried about dementia from all raw. Any data to support or re refute that? Someone's asking, can a raw food diet help with Parkinson's? Um, someone's asked you, do you have arthritis? So some of these uh, conditions are obviously related to older age. So I don't know if you want to try and answer all of them together. Okay. I don't have arthritis. <laughs> Personally, although my spine is not as flexible as it was when I was a young gymnast. Uh, and if you want to call that arthritis, you could, I, I would say I've just been putting my, my attentions on other aspects of fitness rather than the amount of attention I put on flexibility as a youngster. Um, in terms of Parkinson's, er, laws of life again, but every condition responds to healthful living but there are limits to everything that, are, that relate to the bandwidth that a human body has to be able to heal itself. So as, as various disease conditions progress from acute to chronic to, to degenerative to pathogenic, uh, you know, what we call in, in cancers, for instance, they call them the stages of cancers. You know, you get, you have everybody's got cancer cells in them uh, and then 15 or 20 years later of development you can finally spot the cancer this is a stage one when it can finally be spotted but that's 15 or 20 years of development and then and then later on after that uh, we get to stage two and stage three and 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 usually through stage one two and three things are quite reversible 
uh, when they get when they get into stage four and stage five so uh, and this is for ms2 um, as far as as far as mental acuity i would say the opposite is true i would say that it's cooked food that's generating the mass majority of the of the alzheimer's and mad cow disease and various yeah. lack, of, lack of mental aware i mean one of the comments that we hear most commonly with raw foods is that people say wow my thinking just became so clear sure. i've never been so clear-minded i've never been so clear-headed i've never had such good recall i've never been able to to follow a conversation so well or to learn so well um, the flip side of that whole thing is i mean if if, if if you get into total dementia it's really not a worry for you anymore <laughs> so i wouldn't worry but that's what i'm not going to worry about because until i have it i'm very clear that i don't have it and well, once, once i do have it i won't even know i, I want to mention that though because um a lot of dementia is also called vascular dementia sure as far as i'm aware is basically because my, my grandmother's got dementia and uh, quite severe and basically like she's in a home and all that kind of stuff and the doctor said to her to my grandfather years ago he they, ba they basically connected to cholesterol they yeah. they connected with cholesterol and i was saying well why don't we get cholesterol out of our diet the doctor's telling you it's cholesterol <laughs> I mean, and i don't i think still she's probably eating whatever they're serving her in the hospital unfortunately but you know the the, the doctors are telling people that it's vascular dementia so and that, I mean, is, is, uh, am I right in thinking that that's basically the arteries up to the brain, the blood vessels to the, the brain are blocked, and that's you're very, you're very that. right. I mean, uh, years ago, um, this goes back to 1989. Uh, in 1989, I had an intern working with me. She was a nurse, a very nice lady named Pam. And uh, actually, I'm going to say better than nice, a wonderful lady named Pam. She worked for me. Uh, in in the intern program that i i ran back then and she did such a good job in the three months that she came for that i asked her to please stay for a full year and she was going to stay for a full year uh working under our lead intern and yeah. and then a couple of weeks after she said yes i'll stay for the full year i want to keep learning uh, yeah. she said i have to leave i have to leave as soon as possible i said why she said because my mom my mom's alzheimer's has progressed so badly that at this point she's she's really non-functional i mean she can't be left on her own anymore and, yeah. and somebody has to care for her and there's nobody else in the family that can and i'm the only one that's available so i'm gonna have to go live with my mom so she did she went to go live with her mom and i didn't see her we stayed in touch a little bit but i didn't see her for more than a year uh and when i saw her about 18 months later i saw her at a conference and she was by herself and i go pam what happened what's happened to your mom and and, and she goes oh when i got there mom didn't even know what to do with the food that i gave her she didn't i mean i had to literally feed her because she didn't even know when i put food in front of her that it was you know that she was supposed to eat it yeah and so i started feeding her and at this point she no longer cared what i fed her and so i just started giving her fruits and vegetables i just started giving her raw food fruits and vegetables and within six months her mom was back to living on her own wow so she had progressed dramatically from almost zombie to being able to totally live on her own pam feeling that she could leave her mom and and let her go that she didn't need any more care so i have seen reversals even even in pretty severe states and yes you're right a lot of it could have been as easy as just removing the cholesterol it's kind of like that film awakenings with uh robin williams if you ever seen that i mean it was it was a brilliant awakening and i yeah. have seen people i have seen people in pretty pretty advanced states of dementia 
And then they go on to 80, 10, 10, they go into raw food, they go into a, a vegan program, a raw vegan program that allows the body to heal itself, which the body's always doing anyway. Right. And, and they recover massive amounts of clarity. Sure. Well, uh, let's go into another question. Let's go into another question. Thanks, thanks for that. That's a great answer. Um, this one's from, I believe this is from Diane. Just two yeah, I'm more second, I've, got a, I've got a power cord that, that ran away and I'll be, I just have to grab it. Are you running out of power? No, i just running out of power. <laughs> well, I got power. <laughs> I just didn't want to get to that emergency state. All right, I'm with you. Right. Uh, yeah, so Diane uh, from New York, good friend. Um, she says, do you eat in restaurants much, having salads or gourmet raw food occasionally, or do you try to avoid restaurants entirely or as much as possible? Well, I grew up in a family where my mom and dad, myself and my sister, always agreed that eating out was kind of fun to do, but that the food was always better at home. <laughs> the food was always better at home, but eating out's kind of fun. Uh, Certainly, when we were in Dublin a couple of weeks ago, you and I ate out at a restaurant. That was pretty nice. I enjoyed eating out. I enjoy the social aspects of that. But to be honest, had I gone to that location with, with the five or six of us and I, yeah, at Cornucopia, it was wonderful. <laughs> um, had I gone to that location and not eaten, but just been there with you guys and experienced the social occasion, I would have been just as happy. Um, so I think the question is a little, I mean, as a rule, I don't, I don't go out much. I I, when I eat at home, I get to eat exactly what I want to eat because I make it. <laughs> and so I get to eat just what I want. Uh, when I make food for other people, I don't really know that they get to eat exactly what they wanted. I'm just guessing, you know, can I make something that they're willing to eat? Hopefully they'll like it, but I don't know. I mean, I, I've been working with Michael now um, for about 15 months making food suggestions, but for the last 10 weeks or so, I've been living with Michael Porter Jr. and making all his food for him. You know, we're talking about a guy eating 7,000 calories a day, usually spread up into seven, sometimes eight meals a day. And so he's eating about the same as you or I, 1,000 calories at a sitting, but he's just blown through a lot more calories. So there's a lot. And learning what he likes and what he, because there's no point in me making something he doesn't like. He just won't eat it. Right. And, and if he doesn't eat what I make, he knows where he can go out and get something that he likes. Yeah. Right? Because when you're hungry, your ability to discriminate quality goes down dramatically compared to when you're full. So I want to keep him happy and full and content with the food I make. I have to make food he likes. So I'm learning, learning which things he does like is a process. Uh, you can't always hit that perfectly. When you go to a restaurant, uh, you know, you're back to that hit and miss thing. Hopefully the chef can make something you like. But there's, there's a lot you don't know when you go into a restaurant setting. I've, having worked in restaurants, I know that an awful lot goes on behind the scenes that, yes. uh, you know, did they soak stuff in well, the cool. yeah. Did they I soak mean, salt water? Did they do something to yeah. make the food special in some way? There's a lot of ingredients not listed. I've talked to lots of chefs who tell me, oh yeah, we have ingredients that we don't list because people don't want to eat those things. So we just don't put them on the ingredients list. Well, connect, connected to this question, someone has asked, when will our 8 10 10 restaurant start? I think there's many restaurants that offer 80 10 10 options, probably more than <laughs> people know. Uh, I think the, the person asking the question um, if you're interested to open an 80 10 10 restaurant, I'm more than happy to help you do that. <laughs> there is a guy in, in 
there's a guy in Detroit, Michigan, who came, who came for a, a month of Cedra Woolley retreats a few years ago. And he's in the process of opening a national chain of 80, 10, 10 restaurants. Uh, he has opened at least one, maybe several in Michigan already uh, as, as his test market up in Detroit, just north of Detroit, technically. Oh, wow. And, and he's looking to go national. His whole view is, you know, is very big thinking uh, in terms of, in terms of having chain that he, he can run franchise. So if he can franchise the whole thing, more power to him. Excellent. Well, um, I'm holding my breath, but uh, I can pretty much go to any corner and any street corner and buy a banana. Okay. Well, Here's another um, quick one. Uh, do you need a supplement of zinc and magnesium on a raw food lifestyle? I don't take any supplements uh, on my diet. I, I see no reason to supplement. I do know that the part of the problem is is slightly complex to answer s in a short answer. It's not it's not difficult to answer succinctly, but but to keep it really short. A lot of what we know about nutrition, especially in terms of our nutritional needs, is based upon the needs of people eating a diet that's so far from a raw food diet or a low fat diet uh, that we can't really draw conclusions about our needs based on the need, I mean, you know, a person smoking cigarettes needs a hundred times as much vitamin C as a person who doesn't. A person eating cooked food needs massive amounts more of a large number of minerals. And don't trust me, look it up. It's right there. You know, you can Google, you can Google mineral deficiency caused by eating cooked food or mineral deficiency caused by eating starchy foods and i mean it's it's not stuff i'm making up out of the blue and i've talked about this in in my various key talks where you know knowledge empowers you is my acronym for key and 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 in various key talks about eating starches and and key talks about eating cooked food where we talk about the what are known as anti-nutrients that are formed when you eat cooked food so not only do you lose nutrients when you eat cooked food, which increase your nutrient requirements, but then there's anti-nutrients that neutralize various nutrients within our body, which again increase our need for those nutrients. So, so when we say, oh, well, you know, we need this much zinc. Well, yeah, maybe people eating a cooked food diet need X amount of zinc. But that doesn't mean that necessarily I need to have that much zinc or that I need to eat shellfish in order to get my zinc because that's, that's just literally unfounded. Everything that I require is easily accessible in appropriate proportions on a 80-10-10 low-fat raw vegan diet. We get exactly what we need. Deficiencies aren't to be expected. Let's also remember, however, that not all nutrients are food related and not all deficiencies are food related sure um so next question someone's saying even small amounts of fruit seem to exacerbate candida growth with all the discomfort that brings any thoughts on that sure i mean candida is always going to flare up if the sugar that gets into your bloodstream can't get back out and the limiting factor on eliminating fat, I'm sorry, the limiting factor on eliminating sugar from your bloodstream so that it can then go to the cells where it's needed is always the amount of fat in our diet. This, is, this has been the, it's not the only factor. There is another factor which is need. If the cells if, for instance, if the muscles aren't being used, and hence they don't need fuel, then they're not going to draw fuel out of the bloodstream. So A, we have to be active, and B, 
we have to lower the fat in our diet. If we lower the fat in our diet and we create need for fuel to go somewhere, then when we eat, eat sugars, um, they go into our digestive tract, they go into our bloodstream, and they go right to the cells where they're needed. And we don't have a candida issue. We have a candida issue when the sugar piles up in the blood, has nowhere to go, uh, we start getting over bacterial overgrowths. It's essentially a red tide situation, only it's a white tide in that case. Great. I guess you get that question a lot about candida. A lot of people, a lot of people have, seem to have problems with that. Um, and again, this is why people say, well, why don't you just write a, you know, do something for every disease, create a video for every disease. Well, there's tens of thousands of conditions and it's much, <laughs> to me, to me, I always, I always try, T.C. Fry was a mentor of mine who said, look, Doug, follow the line of thought through to the conclusion. Just keep going where it goes until it finally hits a conclusion point. And the conclusion is, rather than teaching how to prevent 10,000 different diseases, I can just teach how to cause health. Mm -hmm. Next question. Have you ever used nutritional yeast? What are your thoughts about raw vegans using it? Well, nutritional yeast, A, um, well, the answer is yes, I have tasted nutritional yeast. Um, and it's a, it's a addictive flavor for sure. We see people go nuts over it. <laughs> and that tells us a lot already. Yeah. <laughs> it's also a cooked food. Um, there is no raw nutritional yeast. Yeah. Uh, which tells us a lot. Again, um, it's also not really of a, of a caloric nature, caloronutrient nature that I would tend to support, but you use it typically in small enough quantities that that's not a big concern. Yeah. Perhaps for some people, the fact that it's cooked is enough to steer them away from it. Uh, for some people, who, especially the people who are more prone towards addictive type personalities or addictive issues, they, they look at that substance and they go, you know what, this is an all or none kind of a problem for me and I'm better off avoiding it. Uh, there are other people who look at the ethical issues involved. Uh, there is no way that yeast can be considered a plant. I mean, a yeast is not a plant. Therefore, it's not a vegan product. Right. Uh, so it's neither raw nor vegan, um, <laughs> nor is it considered health food uh, in terms of its addictive problems. So uh, at that point, if somebody wants to use it, it's their choice, but it's not something I'm gonna recommend. I know lots of chefs use it because it provides a flavor that, that they don't know how else to create. Sure. Um, and that's okay. You know, it's a, for me, I want to, I want to just keep defining the bullseye of health and helping people go from where they are to where they want to go or towards that bullseye. And for some people, that's a very quick progression. For some people it require a slower progression. That's up to the individual, the motivation level of the individual. Okay, uh, another question that's probably relevant to social leadership, perhaps, is how can I stay on 8 to 10, 10 when I'm the only one in my family eating this way? You know what? Every inhalation you take is yours. Every thought process you have is yours. Uh, every decision you make, every time you swallow, it's yours. Nobody else is doing this stuff to you, for you. Nobody's holding a gun to your head. Uh, yeah. You might be the only Jew in your classroom full of Gentiles, or you might be the only Muslim in a room full of non-Muslims, or you might be the only Republican in a room full of Democrats, or you might be the only white person in a room full of people who are yellow or black or red or spot, you know, I don't know. Um, where you might be the only person with red hair. You might be the only person wearing high heels. You might be the only person who has a third nipple. You might be the only, I, I don't know. Everybody is different. And every family needs leadership. 
So if, if you, as the only person in your family, are not willing to lead in a healthy direction, then no one in your family is going to lead in a healthy direction. And then you, you know, right. there's, always, there's always consequences. It's kind of like going into sleep debt. If you go into sleep debt, if you deprive yourself of sleep, eventually you've got to pay off the debt, but it's you also have hours. to pay off the interest. Sure. You know, if you're not willing to live healthfully, you're going to have to pay that debt, and you're going to, it's going to compound daily, and you're going to have to pay the interest as well. So every family needs a leader, and somebody's got to go first. And the, the, Okay, maybe in some, some families are more supportive than others. In some families, they like to support your efforts to better yourself. and others, they like to make fun of you for your efforts to better yourself. But they're still watching. And if you succeed, they're going to be very proud of you for succeeding. So let success be your, your so there. Let success be your motivation. Let success be how you lead your, the people who mean the most to you. If they can see you thriving on a low-fat, raw, vegan diet, they can see you thriving on 80-10-10. They might not come around as fast as you did or on your time schedule, but they'll come around or they won't. And that's got to be up to them. Yeah. If they want to eat cooked food, that's up to them. If you want to eat raw food, that's up to you. That's great. I wouldn't make a big deal of it. Okay, well, here's a question that comes up so basically what the person's saying is let me just read it out they're saying how to be protearian but i guess how to be on 80 10 10 when the quality of the fruit in the world is so low and they're, they're saying i know uh, they're saying my lifestyle is constant travel i find that to ensure ripe and organic i resort to only eating bananas dates and greens i don't feel it's worth it to eat pesticide gmo pick too early fruit what is your feeling on this so I guess the question is really, do you think that the quality of fruit is, is low? Well, first of all, I, I'm not finding that the quality of fruit is all that low. Uh, I've, I've lived on the road for the last 12 weeks. Um, I've been living, I've been in, I've been in one, two, three, four, five cities in the last 10 weeks. Um, I'm not sure what on the road means to this particular person. There's a lot of different ways to be on the road, <laughs> but you know what I mean by that. I mean, but you know, you could be traveling daily, you could be traveling by airplane, you could be traveling by car. It all, it all matters. It all, it's all a little different, but there's never been a place that I've gone where I wasn't able to call ahead. Uh, there's never there's never been a place where I've gone where I couldn't find good quality fruit that was seasonal. I mean, I was just in Denver and I ate some of the best figs ever. Um, I'm I'm in New Jersey today eating the best white peaches ever. Uh, yeah. I was in New York getting organic candy heart grapes not the cotton candy not the green ones but the the red candy heart grapes that were that were definitely in the top five best grapes i've ever eaten in my life <laughs> you know i mean they were just astonishing downtown manhattan yes i had to pay for them but you know they were the best grapes i've ever eaten they're worth the price uh, right we are you can buy a lot of low quality fruit. I agree. You can buy low quality fruit. You can buy low quality anything. Yes. You can buy quality. I don't think that overall our fruit quality is, is low or it's bad. Uh, in fact, we're, we're constantly helping to, we're, we're definitely hybridizing and and mixing and matching and introducing fruit uh, to other fruits in order to develop the qualities that we most want from our fruit to make it even better for human consumption. And the people say, oh no, that's worse. We're making fruit sweeter. Well, raise your hand if you want your fruit to be sweeter. <laughs> I want my fruit to be sweeter. How about you, Ronnie? You want yeah. sweeter fruit? Definitely. 
Definitely. So I don't think that that's a bad thing, even though pe you know, people say, oh, it's, the fruit's sweeter. I go, well, good. Then I, get, I don't have to eat quite so much to get as many calories as I need, but the taste will be sweet. I think that's a good thing. Uh, I think over a period of time, we do benefit by eating more variety. So I wouldn't recommend living on lettuce and bananas uh, or lettuce and bananas and dates. But I think you know, for a week or a month, that's, that's no big deal. If you're talking about decades of lettuce, banana and dates, I think th I'd say that's a big deal. In the course of the average year though, I, I mean, in the course of an average week, I might, I might only eat a few foods because I really like them and they're in season and that's what's going and that's where I'm focusing. But in the course of a year, I know I eat 200 different fruits and 50 vegetables pretty much year in and year out because I've tracked that on occasion and kept track and it, it doesn't really change much. The choice might change. Yes. Some years I'm more in the tropics and some years I'm more in temperate zones and so I have access to different things. But it still comes out to, to a couple of hundred different, I mean. I want to ask something though. I just want to, I just want to, because I've noticed that you don't really eat a lot of dates compared to no, some like, people who. I don't eat a lot of dates. Yeah. And, 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 um, is, do, do, you, do you feel that they're not a good thing to kind of make a, a, a big part of your raw vegan diet? Well, I don't think dates are, are necessarily a bad thing. They're not something I would avoid. Uh, I prefer juicier fruit than dates. Uh, sometimes in the, heart, in the heart of winter when when because certainly in winter, fruit quality does go down. You know, fruit quality is a, is a seasonal thing. And so summertime, fruit quality is, is far higher than it is in, in our winter time. Um, and sometimes in the, in the heart of winter, if, if I want to break from bananas or we don't have as many bananas as I want to have ripe in the pan, because we blow through bananas and sometimes always having it. I want to make sure my wife, my daughter, has enough ripe bananas today, tomorrow, the next day, the next day, the next day, the next day. So I'm looking at our food and eating according to making sure not only what's available to us, but what's going to be available to them if I eat all the ripe bananas. And, and there'll be times where I'll make a meal of dates and apples because then there'll be more ripe bananas the next day for my family to eat uh, until the next box of bananas comes ripe, you know, but Sometimes you buy a box of bananas that's a little more green or a little more ripe and you don't always, perfect ripening, especially because we do travel a lot as a family. And so we end up with breaks in our, you know, in our supply chain and whatnot. But uh, Excellent. I, personally, it's not, it's not the food that I go, oh, this is my all time favorite food is to eat dates. I'd rather eat a mango. Well, uh, we've still got some questions to go and if anyone wants to ask, try and ask some questions live as well that would be great but uh, we do have a lot of questions still I think we're getting through a lot of them so that's great we're just going to interrupt for a very very short term uh, break from our sponsors for this so, uh, is the UK Fruit Fest and the Canada Fruit Festival so um, Doug will be speaking at both of those events and UK Fruit Fest is very close it's only about just under two weeks away the 25th to the 29th of July. You can get more information at fruitfest.co.uk. And uh, anyone who's watching this today that wants to sign up, you can use Doug's code, which is 801010UK, and you will get 15% off your price. But on top of that, you will get uh, Doug's new book for free if you sign up. And you'll also get a book from almost all of our presenters. So, uh, Fully Raw Christina, who's coming, she's uh, offered us a book that we're going to give to you. Uh, these are all ebooks, just to be clear. Um, there's a book from Grant Campbell, there's a group book from Ted Carr. You can get our recipe book, the festival recipe book. So there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of different a lot of information there for you. 
And um, we'll talk later on about what Doug may be teaching at the festival, but Doug will be teaching every single day. He'll be teaching fitness in the morning and he'll be teaching classes in the afternoon and you'll have plenty of time to ask him your questions the rest of the time. Uh, so that's 8 to 10, 10 UK. And the Canada Fruit Festival is from the 10th to the 13th of August. That will happen in British Columbia. Uh, it's the Okanagan region. It's the nearest airport is called Kelowna. And it's in the west coast of Canada. So it's very close to um, the west coast of America, Los Angeles, San Francisco, very close to Seattle, um, places like that over on the west coast. It's only a couple of hours away by plane. And it's um, one of the one of the first times Doug's well one of the, it's the he's not Doug's not spoken in Canada for a long time I don't think, and um, we're happy to say it's, it's one of the few uh, festivals that he's chosen to appear at in um, in North America in general this year. So uh, that's the Canada Fruit Fest. It's the first year, tenth to the thirteenth of August, and you can get um, I think it's two hundred dollars Canadian off of the, the ticket price if you use the code 801010. So if you want to sign up for that, canadafruitfest.ca and you can use the code 801010 for $200 off your ticket. So I just wanted to mention all that. Um, but this is this is not just an advertisement for the festivals, but we, we do want to make it clear that if you want to learn from more from Doug, then that's a great place to go. Um, okay, let's go on to the next question. So um, Someone has asked, this has been quite popular, the ketogenic diet. It's, it's quite a big you know, trend at the moment. Uh, <laughs> there's always a different trend in the kind of low carb movement. Um, how would you rate the benefits of a ketogenic diet compared to the 8-10-10 lifestyle in the short and long term? And, and, and I want to also, maybe you could, maybe you could uh, teach us about why is it that People do these low. People do the low carb diet, and they seem to get very dramatic weight loss for over the short term. Anyway, and can you explain maybe why that happens and and the and your thoughts on that diet? In fact, what even is ketosis? Can you explain that? Well, uh, sure. Let Let's start because that's a that's a lot of questions. Well, part of one and and. We'll try to un uh, let's see if we can unravel some of that and sort it out. Uh, people eating a standard Western diet are failing on their diet. They're we're getting heavier as as the people in the Western world as a population. We're just getting heavier and heavier and heavier. Uh, if you said there there was an, a war a war on obesity, I would say. Obesity won a long time ago, and the war the war isn't on anymore. The manufacturers have given up the war, <laughs> and chairs are being made wider. Airplane seats are bigger. Uh, I sat in a hospital a few days ago with a friend, and the seat was so wide that I couldn't get each of my uh, both elbows onto an armrest at the same time. <laughs> like, who the heck is me? I, you and I could have both sat in that chair and still had room for Christina in between us. Uh, it was, it was just. And then I looked around and I noticed that all the chairs were that size. They were all these oversized chairs, and it wasn't just the obesity clinic. We weren't in the. We were in a spinal clinic and, and it was, it was spooky. Uh, the serving portion sizes are bigger. Clothing manufacturers have changed the way that they size clothing these days. So what used to be a medium is now much bigger than it used to be, or what used to be a large is much bigger new sizes there used to be large and extra large now there's double x and triple x and quadruple x and five x uh, and and these sizes didn't even exist so i mean we've we've lost that battle and, and people are constantly looking for any kind of a stopgap measure to see if they can somehow keep eating what they're eating 
and lose weight because nobody wants to change what they're eating. I mean, let's be clear. It's like, right. like you don't want to change your politics. You don't want to change your religion. Um, you don't want to give away all your money to charity and have nothing. You don't want to change your diet. I mean, th these feel like these feel like threatening things. And, and we look at this in social leadership in my new book. We look at some of the issues about why do you not want to change your diet? And because this is a very deep inbred thing that started when you were an infant and you were trained by your family to eat a certain way. I mean, this, this is what helped to generate what we call acceptance. And in, and in most adults, acceptance is more important than love. I mean, if we're not accepted, we're ostracized. Right. And, and that's, uh, we're shunned. And, and these, are, these are the worst things that can be done uh, in certainly an anthropoid society, not just human society. Yeah. Being shunned is, is a bad thing. Uh, it, actually, it, it goes on into many other mammals besides just the anthropoids. So, um, so we, look, we look at that a bit in the book, which is, I think, that's fascinating stuff where does that take you in terms of when we look at the diets that people eat in a, I'm going to say, oh, obviously vain attempt to, <laughs> to lose their weight, right? And get their, get their health back under control. Because if what they were doing wasn't working, um, some ever so slightly modified version of what they're doing also isn't gonna work it can't work and, and and even if it somehow miraculously did which it doesn't and i'll explain why um it's only viewed as a temporary thing anyway it's not a lifestyle it's a diet there's a huge difference because it, it is designed to be temporary now we start with a standard western diet where people eat all the meat they want all the butter all the cheese all the dairy all the eggs they want Nobody's restricting butter, milk, eggs, cheese, meat on a standard Western diet. And still about 45 to 50% of all their calories are coming from complex carbohydrates and simple carbohydrates. They're coming from carbohydrates. If you go on a diet where you cut out half of your calorie intake, <laughs> you're going to lose weight. And you're going to lose weight more dramatically than you think because now you can still eat all the butter you want but there's nothing to put it on <laughs> you can eat all the cheese you want but there's nothing to put it on you can have all the meat you want but there's nothing to wrap it in <laughs> and so and people say oh yes i'm on the ketogenic diet i get to eat all the meat i want well you were eating all the meat you wanted when you were on the standard Western diet. Nobody was restricting meat. <laughs> and so the, the calorie intake on the meat, dairy, cheese inside of things tends to actually go down because there's nothing to put it on or hold it in. <laughs> While the calorie intake goes down dramatically because you've cut out half of your total calorie intake. This is different than 80-10-10. In 80 10, 10 yes, indeed, we do reduce the calories from fat, but we make up for that by increasing the calories from carbohydrates. Yes. Ketogenic diet is a, is a, is, it's a temporary fix. It's a fast weight loss program, but it's so high in cholesterol. It's so high in animal fats. It's so high in negative factors and carcinogens and mutagens and teratogens and, and tumorigens and tremorigens and anti-nutrients and it, it's so high in negative factors that it's not even a safe temporary measure yep yeah i mean i, I, I what i want to add to that is just the fact that a lot of people, I mean, I've, I've had friends that have shared with me information about the uh, low carb diet or the ketogenic diet. And there's a lot of marketing information out there about it. There's films that have been made about it. There's a lot of very convincing information that goes out about it. And it can make people think, well, maybe there's some truth to that as well. 
and what I would say to you is that if if you're thinking that way or you're thinking, well, maybe that's healthy as well, you've maybe just not looked into the research enough because even the research that they use to try and back up the diet, a lot of that research doesn't back up the diet when you actually look at it. Um, it's a complete scam. It's a complete falsehood. A lot of the information that they're actually claiming is supporting it is it's, it's absolutely crazy. Um, you can look at some of Michael Greger's videos on that kind of subject. There was a great series years ago of a guy who debunked uh, the low carb. The paleo diet was the cop was the popular one a few years ago. Now it's a ketogenic diet that's got the popular name. And um, as you yeah. say, the program worked. There wouldn't be a new one replacing it every couple of months. <laughs> well, my question is well regarding that. There's also something to bring up. Maybe you could explain this, which is the rapid weight loss is not just the reduction in calories is also to do with when you when you get rid of your glycogen you also lose the water that has to be there to store well, the absolutely i mean the rapid weight loss uh, the, the the amount of glycogen that's in our muscles is diluted by more than a gallon of water i mean hold a gallon of water in your hands it, it's you know the weight of that the weight of that's almost four kilos of water uh, and so if you go on a diet that is low in carbohydrates within the first 48 hours you're going to drop almost four kilos of just water yep it, i mean it's just going to go boom and you go wow look at this i'm losing weight like crazy yeah but you haven't lost an ounce of fat you haven't lost you haven't lost 28 grams of fat you haven't lost 20 grams of fat you haven't lost anything in terms of fat intake or fat loss so people aren't trying to get there's no value in becoming dehydrated in addition to trying to you know while you're trying to lose weight it, it, there's nothing about the program that could be considered a healthy approach to lifestyle yeah um okay well that's covered that quite a lot um you probably can't answer this one. it's a bit specific but i'm a low fat raw vegan but have shown up with low tension glaucoma how can i increase my blood pressure without using salt uh, for the sake of better blood flow to my eyes thank you so much uh, the the best i've seen for improving blood pressure has been intense physical activity i mean a I mean, if you want to just have temporary raise in blood pressure, isometrics where, where you're doing contractions without movement um, will dramatically increase blood pressure, but only temporarily. But even that can be valuable if you're trying to increase blood flow, say, to your face or to your eyes, because it will, it will flush you. Um, but overall, just doing the fitness activities, uh, doing strength activities, doing intense cardio, uh, bursts of activities. Uh, these things will result in long lasting raises in blood pressure that will always work to your advantage. Uh, the other thing of course is to carry enough mineral content so that your uh, sodium levels remain high enough you don't want to go into into hyponatremia low sodium uh, and so we i recommend people you you it's not living on just fruit living on just fruit is really not the recommendation that i'm going to make i'm going to say whether you choose to eat fruity vegetables such as cucumbers and tomatoes in great quantities or whether you want to eat celery and lettuce um, becomes your choice but not not talking about things that are would be just you know an all fruit diet. We've got to eat our vegetables, uh, or you will, you know, you'll crave salty things eventually. And and in some people you'll see hypoglycemia, or I'm sorry, you'll see hyponatremia, you'll see low sodium, you'll see low blood pressure uh, before you even crave salt. Some people you'll crave salt before you see those symptoms. Uh, that's down to the individual. But the way to the way to build that up really is is with some some serious muscular contractions. 
Excellent. I, I, I thought I wasn't sure if you'd be able to answer that one, but that's great. Um, okay. Um, question. Um, I eat so much, I'm constantly stuffed, but I am too thin. How do I add more calories without nuts and avocados, which I cannot eat because I binge on them? Well, being too thin, that's a great question. That's a really, I like that question. Being too thin can imply a wide variety of things. Um, do you mean you're too thin, you don't carry enough body fat? Or do you mean you're too thin, you don't carry enough muscle? Uh, most people say, no, I carry enough body fat. I just don't have enough muscle. And, and there's no food that's going to make you add muscle. Well, adding muscle is going to be down to doing a specific type of resistance exercise in, in a specific way so that you can gain the appropriate musculature. Your body will adapt by adding muscles to that area. Given that you supply enough of the raw materials for the body to do that building, which includes enough carbohydrates and includes having enough fats and includes having enough proteins. Uh, you don't have to eat massive quantities to the point of hurting yourself, to the point of overwhelming your digestive capacity. But our perspective on what is a full-size meal does change with experience. Uh, in a standard Western diet idea where our food is heavily refined, the volume is dramatically reduced. So, I mean, a hamburger can give you 1600 calories and it's only eight or 10 bites or however many bites it takes you to eat a hamburger. Uh, but it's very dry, it's very small. You know, to get those same 1600 calories from bananas, means you're eating almost 20 bananas it's going to be even if it's five bites per banana you know up to 100 bites compared to the dozen bites on a hamburger and if it was lettuce to get 1600 calories from lettuce i mean you're talking about eating i don't know about 20 heads of 20 big heads of lettuce i mean you know a thousand bites <laughs> i don't even know how many bites it is but but so caloric density or calories per bite, if you will, calories per unit volume uh, does play a role here because not only your perception of how many bites you're supposed to eat, but your capacity, your abdominal capacity for handling that many bites, handling that amount of food. I mean, Ronnie used to drink a glass of smoothie. Now hold up your, what's your glass today, Ronnie? Right now, the glass is a two and a half liter glass. I mean, that's a yeah. that's a big glass. And he goes, "Okay, yeah, I'll fill that up once, and that's a you know, I'll have a glass of smoothie." Well, <laughs> you know, I've just gone through the exact same thing while I'm working with Michael Porter, and I would send him off um, with a glass, right? Because yeah. he would want to drink a glass of smoothie. That would be a meal. But the glass was an eight ounce glass. I said, this has to get bigger. So we eventually bought 12 ounce glasses and then we bought 16 ounce glasses. And then I found them 23 ounce glasses. And then I finally found them liter. I started canning them something that's a liter at a time. Go, look, a liter at a time, that's a glass. Because in a liter, I can get you 800 calories in a liter glass of smoothie, no problem. And if I want to make it a little more dense, if you don't need the water as well, I can easily get a thousand calories into a liter of smoothie. So that volume change. For me, I mean, a liter of smoothie is barely enough. I mean, that's just barely enough. I'd much rather have a liter and a half or two liters if I'm, if I'm really not gonna eat that frequently. But Michael wants to eat more frequently, fine. A liter at a time, a thousand calories at a chunk, give him that six or seven times a day. But the perspective on what is full and uh, as my wife Rosie called it, and you're going on an abdominal flexibility program. You're going on you're going on a flexibility program for your stomach to learn to expand just a little bit more over time with a bit of practice. As your perspective changes from wow three bananas is a lot, wow six bananas is a lot, wow nine bananas is a lot, wow twelve bananas isn't that much. Shoot, I could eat fifteen bananas. I had. I had 12 good-sized bananas for my lunch yesterday. It was satisfying, 
but four hours later, I'm starting to think, what's for dinner? Yeah, for sure. So, so I would say the answer is really partly it depends whether you're looking to put on fat. If you're looking to put on fat, you got to eat more calories. And that's going to just take practice of eating, you know, eating more volume, not more frequently, more volume. Yeah. And then, um, but if you're looking to put on muscle at all to gain some weight, then you've got to do the specific exercises. This isn't a food problem. This is an exercise program. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I, there's a there's a guy who's coming to Footfest, and he's living in the same city as me. And and his his the people around him, parents and etc. They're kind of worried about him. He's lost a lot of weight, and uh, I've been speaking to him a little bit. I've I've, I've not um, really been around him for what he's to see what he's doing, but um, from a little bit of speaking to him, I realise he's just not eating enough. And I think that what people forget as well is that when we eat fruit as you spoke about you get an immediate sense of satisfaction because of the, sh the sugar in it and everything and we forget that that's not really a sign that we are fully satisfied with our hunger right it's how long how long after the meal does it take before you're hungry again that's that's my satiation cue that i want to use as my monitor how long does it take before i'm hungry again because if i'm hungry again an hour later I didn't eat enough at the last meal. You know, I, I need to learn that I need to eat a little bit more than that. Unless it's my plan to eat every hour of the day, but come on, you know, that's just not gonna happen. Uh, and it's not, it's not a healthy program. It's not a good, it's not a good, in terms of getting enough calories, people tend to eat less calories or you could actually measure them and say fewer calories uh, if they eat with great frequency, if they're actually getting closer and closer to grazing. Uh, grazing is a way to eat less, not a way to eat more. And a few people have just said a few positive comments. They just wanted to say, um, and one comment is just wanted to take a quick moment to thank you for all you've done for me over the years. I'm not sure I would have made it to the other side without you. Your friend in abundant health, Malcolm in New York hey, City. Hey, Malcolm. I know who Malcolm is. Sure. Uh, Plus, you know what and i want to say while you're on the subject because on the last question you brought up the point ronnie that that you know and your friend up in up in your neck of the woods as we say it down here um <laughs> which i don't think is a glasgow expression <laughs> but you know what i mean uh most people when they start losing fat are shocked to find out how under-muscled they are. Yes. A lot of what they thought, and we were giving themselves credit for being muscle, because fat hides in muscle. Fat wraps around every muscle cell. Fat gets inside the muscle cells. Fat marbles its way through the muscle, uh, through the whole muscle itself. You know, fat, it, fat is very invasive in this way. And as we start losing fat, and we find out, wow, I'm not carrying anywhere as near as much muscle as I was giving myself credit for. Yes. Right? And people say, I'm too skinny. And I'm going, you're not too skinny. You're carrying enough fat. You're just not carrying enough muscle. So you're under muscled, not under fat. Yeah. And, and there's a guy who comes to the UK Fruit Fest. Uh, in fact, he's, he's been a part of the festival for every year. Uh, he's called Simon and he does the he does the, the filming and Simon is a very very lean guy and he's done a lot of uh, long term whatever you want to call it fast juice fast or whatever but he never looks unhealthfully skinny because he he has he has muscle he's best <laughs> and regardless of how skinny he gets he doesn't get that uh, that that look of being you know deathly skinny because because of that so uh, yeah I, I think people need to eat more and that needs to be maybe shouted a bit more by by people and I think we forget that sometimes. I mean this is what we're saying eat more fruit eat more vegetables how do you take better care of yourself eat more fruit and vegetables put more fruits and vegetables on your plate when you're eating enough fruits and vegetables so that's the only thing you want and you're growing to the weight that you want to be not just from eating, but also from exercising, 
you know, then you're getting it right. Otherwise, chances are you're not eating enough. The problem with our diet, is it possible to get overweight on our diet? Yes, it's possible. Is it possible to gain fat on our diet? Yes, it's possible, but you have to work at it. it whereas on a standard Western diet, it's almost the exact opposite is true. So it requires, a, it requires a mindset shift. I've, I've never been, I've, never, I've, I've heard people talk about gaining weight on 80, 10, 10, and, and I understand people who are maybe underweight gaining weight. I can see that. I did it. But, but when I've seen people say, um, I got fat on 80, 10, 10 and things like that, I, uh, I'm skeptical about what they were actually eating because it's, you know, and I don't want to be insulting to people who maybe say that. It's just that I've, I've, when I've seen the people who are very strictly 80, 10, 10, as in, uh, keeping their fat levels very low, they they tend to be the, the leanest people that you <laughs> that you know. And even when they're eating a lot of fruit, they're eating a lot of fruit, or, um, or or as much as they care for anyway. And the people that really gain weight are either the people that are eating cooked food, or they're they're eating some kind of. Uh, to me, they're eating more fat than they're maybe realizing they're eating even. Um, Fats that, sneak in there, don't they? What's that, Doc? Fats sneak in there. They accumulate quickly. Yeah, it's, it's, it's very easy to eat two, three, four avocados, you know, <laughs> without, before you forget, before you think what you've done. But um, <laughs> what have I done? <laughs> but yeah, I mean, but my, I'm in a, it's funny because I'm in a different situation where my diet uh, last year, I, I kind of fell off my optimal diet and I was eating a lot more fat and I was eating things that. I wouldn't usually want to eat and gained weight and now I've been losing weight, but I'm not losing weight, like out of control, losing weight. I'm losing weight very, very steadily, mm -hmm. <laughs> like maybe a pound a week, maybe less, maybe, right. maybe seven, you know, 0. 0.75 yeah, pounds. It's week. not water weight. And yeah. And I'm, all, um, all rapid weight changes are water weight. Uh, yeah. And so even like we said with keto, you know, they go, oh, look how much, how quickly you lose, you know, or all the diets that promote rapid weight loss. This is water weight. Yeah. And, and that's not, that's not what we're trying to, that's not what we're trying to monitor. It's not what we're trying to control. What we're looking to have influence upon is the amount of fat we carry. Yeah. And the amount of muscle we carry. And, and, and that requires effort and time. And, but, you know, can you gain fat? I mean, I got heavier on 80, 10, 10 because I wanted to. Yeah. And, and I was, I was, you know, as I, as I've told people before, I, I was walking around at about 68 kilos and competing in a, in a sport that it was to my advantage to be 75 kilos. So you know, I, I boosted myself back up to 74 kilos. I'm, I'm still right. If I get on the scales today, I'll be about 73 kilos. Am I fat compared to when I was 68 kilos? Well, I mean, this is, uh, I'm definitely fatter. I mean, there's no question I'm fatter. Sure. Uh, but I'm slowly replacing that fat with muscle. It just doesn't come on. Muscle doesn't come on that quickly at age 65. So... <laughs> Uh, you know, but I am putting on a little bit of muscle, but I don't really want to gain much muscle either. I'm not training to gain muscle. I just don't want to lose muscle. So I'm training not, so I'm training so I don't lose muscle. I'm training to get stronger. Uh, I'm not worried about carrying a little bit of fat because being heavier helps me in my sport. Sure. That little bit of heaviness gives me an advantage in my sport. Uh, has my physique changed? Yeah, I, I'm not as hourglass physique. I'm not shaped quite so much like a wasp. I'm shaped a little bit more like a barrel, uh, which supports the strength that I want to develop in my life. The last thing I want to do is be weak. Uh, and you, I mean, you were, you had the kind of eight pack or six pack look, whatever you want to call it. 
So you're maybe more of a two pack now or a four pack? <laughs> yeah, I'm more like a two pack or a four pack. <laughs> well, a few other good comments from people. Nothing to ask, just want to say thanks a banana bunch for all these wonderful words of wisdom, educational contributions about the raw food lifestyle and natural hygiene, kind heartedness, support and fruit friendship. Um, thanks to Dr. Graham for all that you've shared about uh, food and life. And um, uh, someone's asked about when will you be coming to Israel? The raw, the raw movement in Israel is huge. I'm doing a presentation in Israel on the 19th of October. 19th of October, excellent. And that's and with the... Uh, I think I'm doing, I think I'm doing a, 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 like one big talk on the 19th and then an all-day seminar on the 20th. That'll be more this, intimate. This gives me an excuse to try and come out to Israel as well. It sounds like a oh, good you need to meet the people running the raw food movement there, Ronnie. <laughs> they want to do an they want to do an eighty ten ten festival next year. Well, you know, they they've got the right. Food. They're in touch with the right people. That's all I can say. Um, here's another question. Do you mind? I, I'm just going to go. I'm just going to take a, a quick break. We'll let you answer this question. I'll be just minutes the question is actually a lot of people have asked about b12 so firstly someone's asked what foods have b12 what kind of b12 do you recommend for children vitamin b12 deficiency reasons and solutions do you just want to cover b12 in general b12 in general i mean how many times <laughs> oh. <laughs> Give us, i'll be back in a minute food food doesn't supply us with b12 we're, we're really um we're looking in the wrong place if we're looking at our food as a source of B12. There is no food, fruit, vegetable, nut, seed, animal, plant. B12 is not supplied um, as a food source item. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, there are many nutrients that aren't specifically food related and b12 is among those b12 is is a rather complex molecule that is that is actually a combination of an internally produced factor called intrinsic factor produced in your stomach in the lining of your stomach in parietal cells that are known as goblet cells on the on in specific spots on the wall of your stomach uh, and from an external factor called extrinsic factor that is found in the metabolic waste of about a hundred different types of microbacteria that we know about so well, there may be more than a hundred but there's a, a wide variety of bacteria that produce the extrinsic factor as part of their metabolic waste. Essentially, it's micro poop. And we rely on that poop. And, and, and you know, this happens on a big scale too. If you want to find the, the most uh, B12 in a cow, check out their poop. Uh, if you want to find the most B12 in a horse, check out their poop. If you want to find out the most B12 in a human being, check out your poop. Uh, because the microbes that live in our large intestine produce massive quantities of B12 as part of their as part of their waste metabolic factors. So, um, but that B12 typically isn't available to us unless we eat our poop. I'm not recommending poop eating. Uh, <laughs> however, there are those there are microbes that live in our nasal passages in our throat, in our small intestines, uh, in the ileum, jejunum, and duodenum of the small intestine that also produce B12 as part of their metabolic waste. And so every time we and swallow, we're taking in a little bit of B12. Every time <clears throat> We swallow really well and get what's the microbes in our throat come down. Uh, they're giving us a little bit of intrinsic factor. In the small intestines itself are colonies that we can think of as cities inhabited by millions of 
individual microbes and there are thousands of such cities in our small intestines and the microbes are if they're the right variety manufacturing b12 extrinsic factor as part of their metabolic waste which we then absorb in our small intestines so it mixes with the intrinsic factor that's produced in our stomach and combined we get the methylcobalamin the b12 that we require uh, is b12 important sure b12 is important uh, is b12 relevant uh, to a conversation about nutrition i'm not so convinced it is but people can ask about it uh, certainly uh, b12 deficiency first discovered in meat eaters uh, fairly prevalent in meat eaters which is why most of the uh, refined grains that people eat on a standard western diet are enriched and one of the things that they're enriched with is B12. So they add B12 back into a standard Western diet for you to take as a supplement in enriched grains at your, when you eat your total cereal breakfast and when you eat your enriched breads and when you eat your enriched pastas, they all have B12 added to them. Uh, so this is, this is a, a major problem in a standard Western world diet view. Um, on a raw food diet, is it as much of an issue? Uh, well, I mean, there are various factors at play. In a, in a short scale version, you can look and go, well, if you stop eating all those enriched foods, you stop taking in all that B12, you're going to notice a drop in your B12 levels, at least temporarily, until your body can take up the slack and you get the right microbe colonies living in you know, because it takes a couple of weeks for microbial colonies to um, revise their numbers to more healthy stages. Fortunately, it only takes a little while uh, because they have lifestyle, you know, very often reproductive cycles that last 15, 20 minutes. Uh, so you can get a lot of, a lot of generations in a fairly short time. Um, I don't know if that covers it. Is, it. is it more of a problem? Is B12 deficiency more of a problem on a raw diet than cooked? No. Um, if you get B12 deficiency, are you gonna die right away? No. Uh, should you be scared of permanent dis disability or permanent impairment, nerve problems? No. Uh, if you start to suffer B12 deficiency, you will know it. Uh, you will know it for months. You will know it likely for years before you would have to ignore B12 deficiency symptoms for years, typically, before you're gonna come up with permanent impairments. It's not something like, oh, I'm gonna wake up tomorrow with permanent impairment. I had no clue until this morning. By afternoon, I was in trouble. It's not like that. It's not like an infection of your kidneys where you know in three days you could be dead. Uh, right. This is a law. Is it reversible in early stages, absolutely yes, 100%. So if your fingers start tingling or your toes starts tingling or you start experiencing truncal rigidity or you start to experience hallucinations or irritability or things that are, I mean, you can look on the list of, of at least 50 potential B12 deficiency symptoms and, and you could have all of them for a couple of months and start taking B12 and reverse them all in a matter of days. Uh, so I, the, the, the scare tactics used to sell the B12 deficiency is like way overplayed. Uh, That's, that, that is interesting to me. And, and, you know, it's one of those things that even the person on the street, almost if you ask them about a vegan diet, they'll say, yeah, but where'd you get your B12 or whatever? You know, it's, it's almost like, somehow it's really got into into the public consciousness in some way and it's funny that really the way that b12 was discovered as even a nutrient was they were removing uh they were doing some uh, operation where they in the medical industry where they were removing parts of people's guts 
<laughs> without really realizing what they were doing and took out the entire section that had the as you were saying the intrinsic factor and then and then the b12 couldn't uh, be absorbed or metabolized or whatever it is the intrinsic factor does and then people were getting anemia and uh, and then i think if i'm right they basically said well there's no b12 in a vegan's diet so they must get b12 deficiency yeah. and it seems like that's the thought process rather than because uh, I, I, I'm quite skeptical about it. I've never taken B12 in six years as a, a vegan. There's or no seven carnitine years. in a B. There's no carnitine in a vegan diet. So <laughs> yeah. therefore, we must get carnitine deficiency. But no, we don't because animals produce their own carnitine. Yes. Not all animals. The animals that are pure carnivores do not produce their own carnitine they must eat other animals in order to get their carnitine yes but all the vegetarian and vegan and and omnivorous animals they all produce their own carnitine so even a dog um, as compared to a cat a cat must get carnitine from eating other animals or supplement or carnitine supplement uh, a dog doesn't need to because a dog can be a vegan and it's the same thing with b12 i mean we manufacture our own b12 and that's the end of the story <laughs> like people are making a big deal or you know the thing the whole thing with zinc you know make a big deal when it just isn't a big deal Yes, yeah, it's, it's the biggest, and, and it's, um, I've seen so many people who have become very scared and have moved away from a vegan or raw vegan diet because they've, built, they've bought into these, these fears of whether it's B12, and I've, I've seen, and they then become the, the promoter of it, and, and they, they meet vegans and they say, oh, you better, you better watch your B12, I got, I got a problem with that, and, and, and people often are diagnosing themselves as well saying they got b12 symptoms they got this problem that problem and uh, another thing i want to say is that there's there's vegans as well that have had b12 problems but they were taking drugs they were drinking alcohol they were doing all sorts of other things in their lifestyle so um you know the, the, i think i'm pretty right saying the majority of people taking b12 as a supplement are actually just people on the standard diet and, and and so it's a problem for a lot of people but um yeah b12 comes up a lot i suppose you've, you've been answering that one from all your life kind of thing well because it's linked to protein right because it's linked to animal food right therefore where do you get your protein where do you get your b12 but just quickly, if, if someone decided to take B12 as a caution, is there any downside to taking it on a, on a regular not basis? No? Not particularly, no. None, none that I know of. Where you say, oh, well, this is a, there's some, I mean, there's cost. Sure. Cost, cost a little bit of money. Yes. But there's so many people taking B12 these days that you could probably just borrow some from a friend and, and you wouldn't have to. You can pay any money. If you want to know if you're B12 um, deficient, take some B12. And if you feel better, then you were. And if you don't feel any difference, then you weren't. Is it something that you would particularly... I know that it's something that's been related to athletes sometimes taking B12, even non-vegan athletes. Is it something that helps performance in any way? Or is it just a, just a myth? No, just a myth. Okay next question we've got we've, we've been going for quite a while now we're trying to get maybe one or two more questions in uh thanks a lot for spending so much time with us doug um this is an interesting question my carbohydrate metabolism test shows fructose sensitivity how should i deal with this eating fruits I'd like to I'd like to see that testing. <laughs> I've heard people say they've got like uh, allergies to fructose and things like that. They can't eat any fruit. 
Yeah, um, so, because because all the reading that I've done on fructose sensitivity tells me that it's insanely rare. <laughs> insanely rare. I mean, like the odds of ever meeting somebody who's fructose intolerant in my lifetime is is almost, of me. I eat I eat a lot. I meet a lot of fruit eaters, right? And still, the odds of me eating somebody meeting somebody fructose intolerant is 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 so low uh that for me to have met thousands of people who tell me they're fructose intolerant and and i've taken many of these people in fact one of my one of my, i've got a client who I've, I've worked with for the last couple of years and and now her son is going to become a client uh he's a he's a he does professional singing song and dance like he's a opera level yeah. singer and and dancer uh, and so, um, so she's investing a lot of confidence in my work but when she first came to me she told me she was you know diagnosed fructose intolerant we put her on a diet of just fruit <laughs> only fruit and not low fructose fruit for any reason and she showed no negative reactions yeah. Yeah. when she's just eating like bananas and dates. Dates are pretty high fructose. Yeah. So I, I, a lot of times I think that, that either the tests aren't as valid as people want them to be, or the results aren't as valid, or there are other factors skewing and influencing the results because I'm not seeing it. It would, I mean, it'd be like people telling me, you know, every time I breathe, um, I'm just, I'm just oxygen intolerant. Mm -hmm. sure. We're, we're set up to <laughs> move on glucose and fructose. To be intolerant of glucose or fructose um, has to be exceptionally rare, if yeah. it exists at all. If it exists at all, there are. Some, I mean, I'm not saying that it doesn't. I, I have done some homework, um, you know, and there are situations of fructose intolerance. But man, these we're talking about an extremely rare situation. Yes, and uh, the, I think that that misinformation getting out there, the idea that, that fruit would be bad for someone or fructose, um, it's, it's and, and there was a lady, I was promoting the, the fruit festival and a lady said, oh, this wouldn't work for me. I'm, I'm allergic to almost all fruits. Okay. And, you know, I just knew like this, this can't be right. But I also knew that potentially you know, and I think she might have even said, which is terrible because I love fruits or something. Like that. I can't remember. She, I think she said something like that. But anyway, and I was thinking that lady is potentially going to have her life shortened, is going to rapidly increase the chances or drastically increase the chances of her becoming diseased in some way, disabled, uh, take years off her life because someone's told her that she can't eat fruit. <laughs> like it's, it, it, that's how serious it is, really. And I had a friend uh, a couple of years ago a guy in his 60s, I think he was only 60, but he was, it was like he was, you know, 90 years old. He was, he really lived quite a hard, hard lifestyle. And he'd been told by the NHS, and I couldn't believe this, he said, he said, I can't eat organic fruits and vegetables. And I said, I thought, I just thought this is obviously a joke or something. And he said, no, no, I can't, I can't eat organic fruits and vegetables. And he produced a leaflet created by the NHS mm -hmm. that was, a leaflet of what he could eat and what he couldn't eat because he had an supposedly an allergy to salicylic acid mm -hmm. and salicylic and the, the the theory behind this is as crazy as it sounds that salicylic acid is a defense like a, a, a an acid that a, pr a plant produces as a defense against pests and if he if you an organic food therefore has more salicylic acid than non-organic produce which doesn't require to produce as much salicylic acid because it's not um you know it, it doesn't have a problem with pests 
and I I was reading this and it was like alcohol was fine, you know, meats were fine, other things, and non organic fruits and vegetables was off the list, and I just I couldn't believe, you know, and and when someone's been shown that by a doctor or whatever, it's very hard to convince them otherwise. <laughs> okay, so, so in order to be healthy, you have to live an unhealthy lifestyle. Yeah, well, and 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 he's dead now, you know, and uh, he wouldn't go vegetarian or anything, but it happens, you know. Um, I think we've have we run out of questions. Basically, it's been, fun. it's been fun spending time. Um, I hope we'll talk a little bit more about the it's sixteen hours, the special gifts, and the seminars coming up. The yeah, let's, let's let's wrap it up if we can. I think people are saying this is an excellent discussion, terrific interview. Eighty ten ten has changed my life. So there's a lot of a lot of love coming through, and um, just once again to let everyone know, Doug will be teaching at. The UK Fruit Fest in, in just under two weeks' time, the 25th to the 29th of July. He'll be teaching every day. Um, in the mornings, he'll be doing fitness classes. In the afternoons, he'll be doing lectures. Um, and also, he'll be part of the extra day. The extra day is for people who want to do something similar to what Doug's done and become you know, a leader in this lifestyle and become someone who... Um, promotes the lifestyle, helps, helps other people, encourages other people and spreads information um, to help other people in that way. So we'll be sharing stuff like that on our special extra day. And um, uh, Doug, Doug's been part of the festival the last, the last five years. So it's, uh, he's been a big part of it. If you want to sign up, it's 801010UK. It's the site, is the discount code you can use to get 15% off, that's Doug's code. Um, fruitfest.co.uk you can go there you can click on registration you can have a look at all the information and that code will last um, up to the, the festival but if you want to sign up you'll get one of Doug's new books for free you'll get six other ebooks about the raw vegan lifestyle and that will help you on your journey bringing the price down even more so we hope to see you there and Doug will also be at the Canada Fruit Fest from the 10th to the 13th of August. That's just under a month away. First time, first time ever the Canada Fruit Fest has happened. It's the opening year. The first year is always going to be the most exciting. And uh, it's, uh, Doug's going to be a part of that lecture in every single day. The code, if you want to sign up for a discount, is 801010. And you'll get $200 off if you sign up for Canada Fruit Fest with that um, with that code 801010 and uh, yeah we really hope to see you there that is in uh it's a place called Comasket Park and it's in the Okanagan British Columbia but very close to the uh, west coast USA so you've got no there's no, no excuse not to be there it's going to be a big party a big celebration of people on uh, 801010 type lifestyle lots of fruit lots of seasonal local organic fruit you're uh, we're I think the Canada Fruit Fest is probably going to expose the Okanagan as a real fruit capital of the world because I think people don't really see it like that. Yes. But you'll probably eat the best grapes you've ever had. Yeah, so unless it's just too unless it's just too early, but some of the best stone fruit in the world comes out of that valley and then as we get closer to September, so it'll depend on how this year has been progressing. Uh, some of the best grapes in the whole wide world come out of there. Uh, it, it's a, it's a, a really rich and fertile valley. And, and just to reiterate, that's canadafruitfest.ca if anyone wants to go and have a look at that and use the code 801010 to get $200 off the ticket price. Um, I, would ha I just want to say as well, if you sign up for one or both festivals, uh, if you've already signed up for UK, if you want to go to Canada, you'll get you'll get even more off. You get fifty percent off your ticket if you want. That's five zero rather than one five. And um, I'm sure we'll do the same thing backwards for UK as well if you want to do that. But anyway, um, what are you hoping to teach at these events? I know you were, we were talking about the laws of life earlier on, but uh, can you maybe mention a few of the things you want to you want to really dive deep with at the festivals? Well, for sure. Uh, again, I'm gonna I'm gonna look at from the fitness side of things. Uh, I want to look at what I call functional fitness. I want to I want to help people 
be active without getting hurt. Uh, be active and get the most out of that activity. Uh, be active and have a really good time with it. And one of the ways we tend to have a better time with fitness activities is when we improve. So I'm going to be looking at the postures that we use, the mechanics of movement, or if you will, the biomechanics, the kinesiology of, of our movements. Uh, I'm going to show people how to handle load, uh, how to use our leverage in ways that are safe and sound so that we get, we get the most advantage to effort, the best advantage to effort ratio, if you will. Uh, it, sure, we'll have a lot of fun with fitness activities uh, without doing specific sports per se, but just showing people how to become more sound in their, in their movement. Uh, in terms of lectures, I'm, I'm having a blast with what's being asked of me. Uh, to do something on the laws is, is going to be very exciting. To do something for beginners and to help people refine and get their 80-10-10 really zoned in, working for them, uh, will certainly be another, another approach. I want to look at, as I was talking about with you a bit, Ronnie, about the the biology behind how we recover our health versus how athletes recover and then tie that together a little bit with um, the whole concept of recovery and what that's all about because that's that's been an area of specialization for me for a long time now and and if people can understand better the different the different parts of what makes for good recovery. Um, I think they, I think they, they can play harder, play smarter, have more fun doing it, but also be less vulnerable to a lot of the myths that are out there. Excellent. And just uh, briefly, from your experience, what what are the kind of benefits people get generally from attending? an event like this and not just uh, obviously the knowledge you can give, but what will a person's experience be? Well, the, the knowledge base that's going to be there is just profound. I, I, I always say that the best part about festivals though is spending time with people. Uh, in my view of the world, everybody's my master at something. Everybody's my teacher. Uh, so I want to meet as many people as I can. I want to get a chance to have, you know, focused one-on-one, -on -one, look right into your eyes, get to know people. Um, because I have the potential, you know, to learn from everyone. Um, but so do we all. It's, it, friendships are made that become lifetime friendships. Um, if I can use the word networking, um, you know, you're going to meet people that could be potentially friends or of value to you. Uh, you never know where the connections are going to lead you. But anytime you can connect with like-minded people, people with similar issues or similar challenges, anytime you can, you can hook up with people that are supportive of your lifestyle, uh, this, this creates a sense of strength. Uh, you know, you might, you might be out in the world being the only person in your area doing what you do or feeling very alone or, you know, and, it, and it can wear you down. Uh, Coming together at a festival provides a strength that is unlike anything else you could ever have. But meanwhile, you get all your questions answered and you get immersed in a lifestyle because a lot of times people say, well, you know, I'm supportive in, in philosophy. I like the raw food idea, but, uh, you know, it gets to be dinner time and I just can't do it. And here we're going to make it so easy for people to actually live the lifestyle for three, four, five, some people six days. Um, you know, it starts to become normal after a certain number of days. You just wake up in the morning and you eat raw food. And when you go, you're hungry at dinner time, you just go eat raw food. And after a few days, it already starts to become like, oh, this is actually normal. This, this isn't doable. Um, I don't know that I just make up a new word, normable. Uh, this is normal and it's doable. And, and it's something that I could live with because it's very satisfying. And wow, next thing you know, I know how to do this and then people are off and running. So I think it's, 
I think it's quantum leap in sure. in, in in the experience of how to succeed with raw food by yeah. attending a festival. Yeah, I, th I think uh, you made a, a lot of great points there about essentially just the people that you're meeting and and, and I, we have so many people. In, in case you're thinking that it's all the, the elite of raw food that, are, that, that turn up, I have so many people who say this is the first time I've ever been around vegans. This is the first time I've ever been around people that don't eat meat. This is the first time that I've, you know, connected with other people that want to live a healthier lifestyle. It's not all 100% raw vegans. It's people at all different parts of the journey. Most festivals, half the people are newcomers. For sure. Absolutely. And uh, and we were ordering, I was ordering some t-shirts and apparel and things so that people can maybe get some t-shirts that they like. Um, and I'm conscious of the fact that it's not all, it's not all small, you know, this is the sizes are not all the small sizes. So, um, it definitely, is, but it's not as many double X as it is if you were buying for a football game. Right. <laughs> but we, well, I do have, I do have one XXL. There you go. Um, but, He'll uh, show up. Yeah. Well, uh, I, I, I think that's, that's, someone is keeping on asking about anemia. Um, but can you tell us about, just before we, we go, they've, they've asked so many times, I don't want to ignore them. Sure. So, anemia. You know, I, I, I mean, here we're doing generic answers to various health questions and, and anybody's health issues need to be handled really on an individual basis. Um, there are many different types. I don't even know how many different types of anemia. Uh, but perhaps the most common is iron deficiency anemia. And the good news there is that when we're eating a lot of vegetables, we're getting in large quantities of iron. And when we eat things that contain vitamin C, uh, we dramatically increase our ability to absorb iron. Yes. And so this is sort of a double whammy in our favor. We're getting lots of iron and absorbing lots of iron or increasing absorption levels by eating our normal diet, which is very rich. I mean, our, our normal diet is so rich in vitamin C that it actually contains as much vitamin C as Linus Pauling was recommended humans should eat. Uh, Linus Pauling run a, won a Nobel Prize for his work with vitamin C. He was, recommending, he was recommending grams of vitamin C per day, two, three, four, five grams of vitamin C per day when um, standard recommendations are talking about eating three or 400 milligrams of vitamin C. Uh, you know, this is, this was a, it, we're getting a hundred times as much vitamin C as the average person is on a standard Western diet. So we're, we're dramatically improving our iron. Um, it doesn't mean that nobody will ever go iron deficient. Again, there are many issues involved in iron deficiency anemia and they're not all or only diet related. Uh, but the good news on this whole thing, I would say is that if somehow you did manage to go iron deficient anemia or anemic, uh, I have never seen a recurrent case. What does that mean? Well, there are people who tend towards anemia and they go anemic again and again. Their, their anemia recurs. But when people make a diet change, they, when they switch to a low-fat raw vegan diet and for some reason or another eventually end up anemic, and I have seen it happen, I have never seen it recur. So they supplement. They take a little bit of iron for 30 days or 60 days and they they supplement their iron levels because you know i mean it's not worth dying over a philosophy if you've got a if you've got a deficiency by all means supplement correct the deficiency but then make sure that you've also corrected the lifestyle that led to the deficiency I, i've never seen any of those people have a recurring case and lots of them i have stayed in touch with for 15 and 20 years after their anemia and they've still never ever recurred 
anemia. So it's, yep. there, are, there are other factors at play than I'm not getting enough. Uh, one of them has to do with what's called the law of dual effect. And we'll talk about that law of dual effect in my, in my talk at the UK Fruit Festival. Yeah, and, and, and Diane's mentioned, she said, I was actually often anemic before I started this lifestyle. The couple of tests I had since started this lifestyle show my iron is normal. We actually get a lot of iron uh, from fruits and vegetables, which you can see if you enter everything you eat on chronometer or another app. I often hit 200% for the RDA for iron. Right. I mean, getting enough iron isn't the problem, but absorbing iron can be a problem. And other issues in lifestyle or health can be an issue. So as I say, we can't, we can only handle it generically here. Excellent. Well, um, hope that helps. That, yeah. Thanks so much. That was a question that just kept coming up and I thought I better, I better ask you before we go. Um, it's, it's been really fun talking to you. There's a lot of information and what I said to people when we were uh, encouraging people to sign up for the webinar was that you really seem to have a bottomless pit of knowledge when it comes to health. And, and I think a lot of people, and uh, I've spoken to a few people about this. I think a lot of people underestimate how much information and knowledge you've got in, in these areas. And uh, health, would, health is my specialty area. Yeah. <laughs> and I would, I would recommend to a lot of people, if you, um, if you can come to one of these festivals or, or events or one of Doug's own retreats, certainly, certainly go to the foodandsport.com website, have a look at some of the audio programs there. And some of that information is, just a complete other level to what you might have seen in YouTube videos and ebooks that people have put out. Uh, it's really an incredible, especially uh, the Perfect Health program and a few of the others, but really do consider checking those out and uh, listen to those again and again, and you'll get a lot of information from them. Thank and, you. Man. Thank you so much for the platform. Thank you so much for the compliments. Uh, I look forward to getting to spend some time with you again. Uh, that will be a treat for me. Um, we'll see you in less than two weeks. Absolutely. Um, and we want we want to see more people there. So if anyone yeah, wants to come, more the, me the more the merrier. I think we're down to like seven beds left or something for the festival. So uh, you know, there's still there's still Fantastic. some. Day. Join us uh, fruitfest.co.uk. You get a discount with eighty ten ten UK as the code. You'll get fifteen percent off. Um, you'll get free ebooks, you'll get to meet Doug, you'll get to listen to him every day, ask him the questions up close and personal. And um, if you're in Canada, canadafruitfest.ca, use the code 801010 and you can get $200 off your ticket there. We'd love to see you. You're completely welcome in every way. Um, come with your questions, come prepared to learn, uh, to spend a focused period of time to take your health to the next level and or, or if you're already at that level just to meet other people on the same journey and maybe you can learn I to inspire us. I have a question for you Ronnie. Yeah. Is that the new t-shirt? Do you like the t-shirt? Yeah. It's maybe it's maybe uh, the wrong way around. I is also that, no is that the UK Fruit Fest? Yeah and I got this little bag made up. <laughs> nice. Nice. Uh, I let me show you something special, Doug. Let me show you something special. Oh, they come in blue. All right. This, this is something special that I picked up today. I'm just going to show you this. And uh, I was mentioning that we had one XXXL. Is that for me and my muscles? And that is this right here. <laughs> There you go. Oh my goodness gracious. You like that? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> try, to get, try to get it as close as possible to the Denver Nuggets colors. If I couldn't quite get sky blue, but. <laughs> He'll um, love it. That's fantastic. I was thinking we could all sign a card for him to kind of, uh, uh, wish him good success in his career and everything he's, he's so excited to start the new the, 
Man, when the 2018-19 season starts, he just so wants to be in that starting lineup. It's so exciting for him. And, I mean, it's a lifetime dream come true. I understand the life has only been 20 years long, but, but nonetheless, it's been a lifetime dream for him. He's been living and breathing and eating nothing but basketball for 15 years, and he's, he's just so excited to hit that scene and, and bring Denver a, a great – Hopefully they'll have a great season and many more to come. Uh, he's certainly embracing 80-10-10 lifestyle. He's, he's getting his exercise, sleep, and eating right and doing all the right things, learning every day a little bit more how to, how to live as healthfully as possible so that he can get the most out of his career that he, he can give to us the entertainment that we want to see. And that's just... Uh... Doug is working with Michael Porter Jr., who's a, a professional basketball player for the Denver Nuggets. He's just starting his career. And so watch out for him. If you're, a, if you're a, a vegan or raw vegan, you want to be supporting him as he's working with Doug and could be a very big oh. impact on uh, getting more people to... Uh, sure. I mean, when I talk about growing up the movement, I don't think anything that I've ever done is going to have a bigger impact, a positive, effective generating more vegan, more raw vegan, more low-fat raw vegan, especially uh, than Michael Porter's success. The fact that I'm working with him, you know, day in and day out. And um, I think that that's, his diet is going to become so notorious. It's going to get so much airtime uh, that it's just, it's, it's really spectacular. It's going to be good for all of us. Absolutely. So um, thanks everyone for watching. As as we've gone on longer than than we what, than we expected sure. to, but uh, hope that's okay for everyone, and hope that's okay for you, Doug, as well. Yeah, I got to go rake some apples off the grass, but other than that, I'm good. <laughs> <laughs> so we're just excited to be sharing this information with more people. Thanks so much for uh, being focused for asking your questions. This will be this is being recorded. We can put it back up online. For those who are wondering about that and, and we'll try and cut it up so that you can go to the relevant section and, and so on. Thank you for joining. Doug, any, any last statement? No, I'm just, I'm, you know, it's that time of year that for me is very exciting. I'm looking forward to UK Fruit Fest. Uh, as I've told you so many times before, it is a highlight of my year. Um, it's one that I gear up for and I'm, I'm excited to come. Um, I'm going to be on a, I'm going to be on a plane tomorrow heading to the UK and and you know just get getting myself ready uh, i'm so appreciative of of the invitation to be part of this event and to add to it and just looking forward to what is always a spectacularly good time and of course with canada free fest i mean that's that's just icing on the cake isn't it really Kelowna is a beautiful area uh, all, all of BC is really a beautiful area. Uh, I haven't lectured out in, in that part of the world for, I don't know, I think it's been five or maybe six years since I've been out, out to Victoria and Vancouver. Uh, it's been a good while already. So uh, I'm sure it, the reception in that part of the country has always been really good for raw food. I'm sure we'll pull from the whole West Coast uh, quickly. And I'm looking forward to that new festival just bringing up. Yes, absolutely. So thank, uh, thanks for coming, Doug. Thanks for being part of it, for being the inspiration for so many people in this movement. You may not uh, definitely that, answer. Know, Ronnie, but um, as I said, you know, you need to, you need to get up with the people in Israel because, because uh, the saying in many households is next year in Israel. So to see Canada Fruit Fest just start from nothing and become a big event in no time, um, I think that's gonna inspire a lot of people in Israel that they can do the same and create a big event in a very short time. Uh, so Absolutely. hopefully you'll be part of that. And yeah, I mean, that, that is- bro. I think people underestimate how many people out there are interested in this and want to get together with other raw vegans. Well, you know, there's more vegans per population in Israel than anywhere else in the world. So and that's amazing. And um, <clears throat> and people connected with Israel have, for some reason, played quite a large role in the raw vegan 
uh, movement over the last few years, uh, yourself obviously, but you look at even the Woodstock Fruit Festival started by uh, the Arnsteins and, um, and even that site is owned by a man with uh, connections to Israel, I think, so it's, it's kind of, yeah, so it's, uh, it is a great, it's, it is where the next festival is going to be, 100%. But we need these festivals popping up in Australia, uh, in South Africa, and I mean, I'm just thinking English speaking countries. And America could probably have 50 festivals, and I'm not even, I'm not, one for every state. I, I, I know that some of the states are a little smaller, but there could be a, I think there is actually a Florida festival starting. Um, uh, California would prop, would have to be that that must be the place where the biggest festival would happen. Uh, but even China, I, I've I've been contacted. There's a a film company that want to come from China to UK Fruit Fest. They want to film. They they've got a documentary series. They apparently called Legend of Fruits. That's in China, and they think that they reach as many as two two hundred million people. With their documentary series so <laughs> i don't know if that's cumulatively or per episode or whatever but they want to come and film us uh and i'm going to try and get them to come to other things as well if they, if, if they really want to take it seriously sure so fantastic well again ronnie thank you so very yeah. very much i'm going to take off i got a couple of commitments today uh this is a treat Thanks so much. hope everybody that's watching this comes over and says hello to me at the uk fruit fest have a good night, Doug. Thanks, Thanks. everyone. We'll Thank end you. it there. All righty. Bye-bye now.